Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to New Books Network. I'm Galina Limorenko, doctoral candidate in neuroscience with a focus on biochemistry and molecular biology of neurodegenerative diseases at the PFL in Switzerland, and will be your host today. Today, we'll be talking to Sarah Manning Peskin about the new book, A Molecule Away from Madness, Tales of a Hijacked Brain. A neurologist regales listeners with extraordinary stories of the brain under siege. Cognitive neuro- neurologist Sarah Manning Peskin demystifies the most curious neurological phenomena through the perspective of patients, researchers, and science. A molecule away from madness offers a captivating singular view of the human brain. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Kalina. It's so nice to, to be with you. So I would like to start by asking, how has this pandemic influenced you and your work? So it's a great question. Um, I'm a, a cognitive neurologist, so most of the patients I see are coming in with complaints about changes in, in memory or behavior or language. And it actually turned out that many of our appointments were pretty easily compatible compatible with virtual settings. So we do quite a bit more virtual medicine now than we ever did before. And it's been, a, in some ways, a, a nice learning experience. And even now that we're back seeing most of our patients in person, we've been able to, to preserve some telemedicine visits. Uh, it's, been, it's been really useful for a lot of people. And you yourself, did you have to stop traveling, for example? Are you getting back into it? So actually, we, we hadn't traveled for a long time, and we, we just traveled to South Africa about two weeks ago, and that was the first trip we'd taken since the pandemic started. So it felt a little bit surreal to be in an airport again. Our son, who's four, we realized had never been on an escalator. And, uh, and now we're starting to ease back into normalcy, which feels good. So can you tell us more about yourself? So I, I grew up outside Boston and, uh, and was there for most of my life through college. And then I came down to Philadelphia to Penn for medical school. And then I've been here ever since. And how did you get interested in studying medicine? So initially, I, I actually had wanted to be a scientist. So in college, I worked in a laboratory that I loved. It was a, a biochemistry laboratory, and we worked on uh, looking at the shell that bacteria create to help protect themselves. And we looked at how bacteria create it and how do they recycle the materials. And, uh, and I loved the work at the time. And so I left college with the plan of trying to start my own laboratory. And I applied to a combined programs where you actually get an a MD and a PhD as part of one program and ended up coming down to, to Philadelphia. And I started the program and I got about a year into the, you, you do the beginning of medical school. And then I got about a year into the, the PhD portion and realized that I actually loved writing about science and I loved writing about about research and I loved creating the proposals, but I didn't actually be, want to be the one growing back vats of bacteria and uh, plating things on petri dishes. And so I ended up uh, quitting my PhD and and finishing medical school. And then as an intern, you had to do uh, two months of night float where you're on only at night. And and it's lonely. And sometimes there are quiet times. And that's when I started writing and things sort of evolved from there. And how did you get interested in brain? So once I went back to medical school and realized I had to choose something, I I realized that the diseases that I was most interested in were the ones that caused these wild personality altering effects where you they essentially created one person from another you could sort of imagine a, you know a, a typical couple who goes to couples therapy and one person says you know this isn't the person i married these are conditions where molecularly that's very much true where it, it changes people's identities and i w- was just sort of fascinated by how they work from a scientific perspective and also the social implications of these conditions cuz they're very much sort of whole family diseases. It's not, a, it's not a broken arm where you treat one person and that's about it. These are conditions where we really essentially treat entire families. You have a really fascinating um, career journey. So I was wondering, were there any mentors or your colleagues that were very supportive along the way? 
Yeah, I've, I've been incredibly lucky where I've had lots of people who have, yeah, who have helped me along the way because I, I didn't really know where I was going for a long time. Uh, when I was in college, the laboratory I worked in was, was Dan Kahn's laboratory, and he was wonderful. And he had actually had sort of a circuitous route in getting to be a, a basic science professor. And so that was a good role model for me to see how you know changing careers can be joyful and wonderful and successful. And then uh, when I was working on research at Penn, I was in Rahul Kohli's lab and, and he also was just, he was fantastic. And when I, I remember going to talk to him and saying that I, I thought I was going to quit my PhD and he had put resources into me, he'd spent time training me and he just sort of saw me as a whole person, was very quick to say, you know, I can understand that it sounds like this is right for, for your life. And uh, he just was incredibly compassionate and, and was a wonderful mentor for me, just beyond just the, the, the basic science bench. Uh, and then when I've been in medicine, I've just had uh, some, some wonderful people who have led me along the way, uh, which I, I don't think I could name all of them, but, uh, but uh, most recently, uh, I was sort of trained by Maury Grossman, who's an expert on frontotemporal dementia, and Dave Wolk, who's an expert on, on Alzheimer's disease, and Dina Jacobs, and Mike Rubenstein, and, and, and a whole slew of other folks. You are in this unique position to have the scientific background and also medical background. So you're uh, kind of marrying these two together. So I was wondering if you could comment on how has this uh, helped you in uh, medicine? I think it's given me an understanding of the fact that all of these medicines that we use come from these basic science resources. And one of the problems that we've sort of run into is that you have lots of basic scientists and you have lots of doctors. And we've been working for years at increasing communication between those two groups of people. The whole purpose of MD-PhD programs is to smooth out that pathway between the research bench and the bedside with patients. And so I think, you know, even though I never finished the MD-PhD program, I think it gave me a sense uh, of that trajectory between research and basic science and animal models going into actual patient uh, translational studies and then going into just regular practice in the clinic. And what would you say to our younger listeners and uh, students or early career researchers? Yeah, so I think what I would what I would tell them was what I wish I uh, had felt better about when I was younger, which is that it's okay to change directions. And I remember when I was trying to decide whether or not to quit my PhD, feeling like it was such a, a huge decision. And then I, I watched a, actually a TED Talk that talked about that when decisions are really difficult, it often means that both options are probably you know, okay. And uh, that was some of the best piece of advice that I remember ever getting. And it turned out that doing a shift in my career and changing focus turned out to be one of the most fulfilling things that uh, that I've done. I, I, I love what I do now and having part of my time be clinical and in clinical research and part of my time being writing. And it's totally different than what I thought I would be doing you know, 10 years ago. So you can really see the passion for both those things uh, in your book for brain and for writing. And your book is A Molecule Away from Madness, Tales of a Hijacked Brain. Can you tell us how did you come to writing it? So I've always been fascinated by these patients with these unusual diseases that change their personalities. And I think I, I wanted to share the stories and try to capture what is it like to live with these diseases, both for the patients, but also for their families? You know, what is it like to be married to someone who acts completely different than what they used to and has no insight? Yeah, you know, what is it like to be, you know, a parent to someone who's become suddenly psychotic and you can't figure out why? And then I also wanted to be a bit of a entertainer in telling the stories of these scientists who figured out the molecules that were causing these diseases. And these are oftentimes heroic people who were, in many cases, totally ostracized. They were you know, made fun of. People didn't trust them. And they turned out to be correct. Yeah, but they, they went through a rough time in many cases. All right, so let's delve into some of the science uh, that you cover in your book, and we can start with the basics. Can you tell us what are the neurons? Uh, 
So neurons are the sort of primary cell that we think of when we think of what connects our brains to the rest of our bodies and what helps us think. And so the brain actually has lots of neurons and then it has lots of other supportive cells. But neurons are really the, the, the main drivers of our cognition. And how are they organized um, on the sort of higher levels? So par- different parts of the brain tend to do different things. And we are learning more about this every day. And every day we figure out that things are even more connected than we ever realized. But in general, we think of different parts of the brain having roughly different sort of jobs. So the front of the brain is often helpful with uh, getting us to initiate activities, giving us motivation. It also actually helps us with our uh, controlling our impulses. And then it helps us with sort of multitasking and organization and, and judgment. The sides of our brain, uh, called the temporal lobes, those are often helpful yeah, in uh, language, uh, particularly on the left side for most people. Um, and they also, the, the, medial, tem- the medial, medial temporal lobes, which are sort of, if you draw a line from ear to ear, um, about a third of the way in in each side are uh, memory structures that help us remember things. Uh, in particular with our our short-term memory. Um, In the back of the brain, uh, there are areas that help us interpret what we see. So you, your, your eyes pick up information, they pick up light uh, that's coming in from the outside world, and all that information gets sent to the back of the brain where we make sense of it. Uh, And then uh, sort of the back at the top of the brain is something called the parietal lobes. And those help us with uh, uh, sort of some visual spatial function. uh, And they help us also with some uh, calculations, knowing our left from our right, and uh, and helping us understand uh, sort of how to perform complex actions like uh, using a fork and knife or using a can opener or things like that. And what do we know Uh, about the mechanisms on how these cells communicate between each other? So it's a great question. In some sense, we know a lot. And in some sense, there's there's much that we don't know. Uh, So neurons uh, communicate with each other. They're actually, they're not all connected directly. So it used to be thought that the nervous system was made of one giant cell. Um, And you can imagine that's the easiest concept, because if you have to get a signal from your brain to your toes, wouldn't it be easiest if it was just a giant cell that went all the way down? But it turns out, actually, that the nervous system has lots of different cells. And in order to communicate from one neuron to the next, uh, they actually use chemicals. So they actually send out little molecules that then are detected by the next neuron. And that's how the signals are, are transmitted for the most part. So what are the ways that these processes could go wrong or ori? So there, there are lots of ways for it to go wrong. And that's part of what I, what I wrote about in the book is um, I divided these sort of mechanisms into four buckets, which are uh, mutants, rebels, invaders, and evaders. And mutants were uh, DNA level changes and uh, uh, or, um, uh, rebels were abnormal proteins or sort of recalcitrant proteins and invaders were things that were not supposed to be there that end up invading the brain and evaders are molecules that are supposed to be there that are conspicuously absent. So what do you mean when you say molecule? It's a great, great question. So a molecule is just a collection of connected atoms. You could sort of think of it as a bunch of tiny Lego blocks uh, clicked together. So you mentioned these categories that you sort of put these different molecules into. And can we start with the first one, the mutants? So what kind of issues can the mutants cause in brain? So again, so these are uh, mutants, they're changes in DNA. And uh, some of the examples that I wrote about in the book, one of them was Huntington's disease. So that's a condition that causes people to have these sort of writhing, sort of dance-like movements that they can't control in their limbs. And it also causes people to have cognitive issues to develop dementia. And uh, that's a condition that turns out is caused by a change in people's DNA in a particular location. And that was actually discovered in part uh, by a woman named Nancy Wexler, who has sort of a fascinating story. She was a a brilliant woman uh, who um, 
did a Fulbright scholarship and was off after finishing the scholarship. She was off in Europe and her dad gives her a call and says, could you come home for my birthday? And she's, she's sort of skeptical. She says, you know, that's unusual for him to ask me to come home for his birthday, but she flies home anyways. And her dad sits her down along with her sister and says, your, your mom has, has Huntington's disease. And at the time, she was about to start a a PhD program in psychology, and she ends up sort of overhauling her whole life and doing her PhD on Huntington's disease. And then she turns to trying to find the place in our genomes or trying to find the piece of DNA that causes Huntington's disease. And at the time, she there, there was one source that I found that says she's taken one biology class. When I spoke with her sister, she said she doesn't think she'd taken any. Uh, but, but despite that, she had this incredible drive. So she creates these workshops where she brings together scientists from all these different fields, and they come up with this idea for how to find the gene that causes Huntington's disease, and they're ultimately successful. And their technique ends up being used for thousands of other uh, diseases in finding the genetic cause of these conditions. So it really revolutionizes not only the field of Huntington's disease, but actually the entire field of, of genetics. So is it all, always the case that um, sort of mutant part of the d- disease is the her- hereditary or can it be sporadic as well? So it could be either. So you're exactly right. So so sometimes people will have a mutation that they've gotten from their parents. And oftentimes, depending on the type of mutation, but sometimes we'll have cases where someone will develop symptoms. Uh, so we, uh, someone will develop difficulty with speaking. And uh, we'll say, you know, has anyone had anything like this? And they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, my, my parent had something similar at around a similar age. Or my parent had some similar, you know, behavior changes around the same age. So sometimes things are genetic. So there's a DNA level change and they're inherited. But there's also something called sporadic mutations. And that's where in development, so in the womb uh, very early on, someone has a mutation in their DNA that happens when you're copying your DNA to create more cells to grow your, your as a baby, so to grow the fetus. And so in that case, people will have a mutation in their DNA, but actually their family doesn't have it. And so they would be at risk of passing that on to their children, even though no one in the previous generation had it. So how advanced are we in detection of these uh, mutations nowadays? So in some cases, we're really good at it. So we know that every case of Huntington's disease is caused by a change in the same piece of DNA. We even know what that change typically looks like. So we know exactly where to look when we're concerned about Huntington's disease. There are other conditions, though, where we we don't know exactly where to look or where we think that there are multiple genes involved, where each one sort of confers a, a little bit of an increased risk or a little bit of a decreased risk. And we're not as good at calculating on a sum total how does someone's genetic profile sort of add up for a particular condition. Uh, so you could take something like Alzheimer's disease, where it's we think it's a combination of you know genetics and environment for most people. Um, and so other than a very small portion of folks who have Alzheimer's disease that's caused by a single you know genetic mutation, for most people, I can't point to a gene that's causing their symptoms. So now going to the next category, and I'm glad that you mentioned Alzheimer's. So what about proteins that can go bad? So the, the second quarter was these, the second part of the book was about rebels. And, and these are proteins that are uh, essentially supposed to help us. And turns out they, they turn on us and they target our brains. And uh, in particular, I start off talking about uh, conditions where the immune system uh, goes awry and uh, these proteins called antibodies that we often use to attack, you know, bacteria or viruses that are invading us uh, instead actually attack our own brains. And so one of the stories I talk about is a a woman who was, uh, she's highly educated, highly successful. She finishes uh, elite university, comes home and uh, wakes up one morning and asks her mom what's for breakfast. She goes back to sleep, and then she wakes up again, asks her mom the same question, what's for breakfast? Her mom thinks it's a little unusual. She goes back to sleep. She wakes up again, asks the same question, and by that Mm -hmm. time, her mom is thinking, you know, something is up. 
And uh, she ends up getting a bit unsteady on her feet and she gets a fever and her mom takes her to the hospital and they're sitting in the waiting room and she suddenly uh, attacks the doctor who's there. And lots of security guards have to come and, uh, and restrain her. And she becomes just psychotic. She actually... She had been walking, watching a show called The Walking Dead prior to the episode, and she starts to believe that she's living in The Walking Dead. So she starts to call people who she sees by names of characters in the show. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just sort of a, a, a terrifying uh, situation. And she gets admitted to the hospital. Doctors can't figure out what's going wrong. Everything seems to look normal. Uh, and her mom finds this article about a condition where the immune system attacks the brain. And uh, eventually she convinces the team to, to transfer her to a different hospital where they send off the test to look for this disease. And it turns out she has this condition. And it, remarkably, there is a treatment. So she actually receives medications uh, that suppress her immune system. And she uh, has actually a, a surgery to take out the, the uh, tumor that they actually had no idea idea existed, uh, but it turns out it was probably causing her symptoms. And she actually does quite well. And she goes back to, you know, her academic uh, pursuits. That is a terrifying story. <laughs> but pretty amazing that we can treat these conditions, uh, that people can get better. So talking about getting better, many of our listeners would be familiar with a scrapie disease, uh, which uh, um, affects uh, sheep uh, particularly, and sometimes can cause human um, disease as well. So can you tell us what do we know about that? Yeah, so these are these fascinating collection of diseases where a protein actually acts like an infection. So you have a protein that proteins are really complicated. They have to have a really specific three-dimensional structure in order to work. And there are some proteins where they can misfold in a particularly dangerous type of way, and then they cause proteins that are around them to do the same thing. They basically recruit followers, and it can cause a, a dramatic and, and lethal condition. And uh, this was first sort of uh, discovered uh, in a disease called Kuru that was this uh, remarkable condition that affected women and children in this remote part of Papua New Guinea. And the the people who came down with the condition, they would get really unstable. They'd have trouble walking. Their speech would get slurred. They often would sort of laugh uncontrollably, even though you know nothing was funny. And it was obviously a, a serious situation. And they would die within a year or so. Uh, and nobody could figure out what was happening. And ultimately, uh, through some uh, very sort of uh, innovative and uh, uh, impressive researchers, they actually connected that disease, which they called Kuru, to Scrapie, a similar disease in sheep, and to a disease called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which is a similar disease in humans. And it turned out that all of these conditions were caused by proteins that would act like infections and cause lots of other proteins to misfold, and that's what caused the disease. And in the, in the case of Kuru, which was this condition in Papua New Guinea, it turned out the condition was uh, was transmitted because people had a, a, a habit of cannibalism, where when people would die, they would actually, uh, other people in the tribe would, would eat the brains. And typically, it was the women and children who were eating the brains of these people who had passed away. And that's how the disease was transmitted from one person to another. So how was Kuru stopped? So eventually, they actually figured out what was causing it. So they figured out the connection to cannibalism, and cannibalism was outlawed. And then the cases went down. Oh, this is fascinating. So it's completely wiped out uh, the cause of the disease. Yeah, as far as we know, there are you know there are no new cases of, of Kuru. There are still cases of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. We don't we, that's the related condition, and that uh, we don't really know why that disease happens to some people and not others in most cases. Um, but but Kuru was essentially wiped out after we figured out the connection with cannibalism. And what are the ways to diagnose Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease nowadays? So for a long time, it was really hard to diagnose. Yeah, but there are some features. If you look at a particular type of MRI, sometimes you'll see a ribbon of brightness around the edge of the brain. Um, or if you look at an EEG, which is a test of the electricity in the brain, there is a, a particular pattern that you see that's sort of a, like a metronomic repeating pattern. Yeah, but, 
And then uh, if you look at the fluid that bathes the brain and the spinal cord, there were some particular tests that people could send. But until relatively recently, those those tests were not great. Uh, but, but then actually there's a new test that was developed uh, in more recent times that's actually become the gold standard. It's a test on spinal fluid. So that's how we diagnose it now. Uh, it, it's sort of a, the, that's what we think of as the gold standard. People do have to be particularly careful when they're extracting that spinal fluid uh, because we do worry that it can be infectious. And so we have to have people take extra precautions when they're doing it. Really, truly fascinating and perhaps visceral aspects of these two first categories that you describe is that something goes wrong with our body itself. So both DNA or proteins sort of uh, getting getting bad. Now, what about the next categories? So who are the invaders? So the invaders are things that shouldn't be in our body that end up invading our body. So DNA and proteins, you know, we always have those. Yeah, but these are things that we put into our bodies. There are toxins and, and often medications. Yeah, so one of the, the examples I talk about in the book is there, there's a theory that Abraham Lincoln might have had mercury poisoning. There's a lot of secondhand accounts uh, suggesting that he took a medication that contained a lot of mercury. And we know that mercury can cause people to be sort of, uh, they can cause people to be aggressive. It can cause people to have difficulty sleeping. It can cause people to become antisocial. Um, and, and we think of Lincoln as being this sort of even keeled, thoughtful, uh, sort of uh, non-volatile character. But there are these instances of him being relatively volatile. And there is some thought that, you know, could that have been related to mercury poisoning? We, we can never prove it. Uh, and so we'll never really know. But it's a, an interesting sort of uh, idea. Is this also the case with lead? So it's a great question. Um, so right, so lead is an example of a, a uh, environmental toxin that uh, can invade the body and, and can wreak havoc. So it sounds like it's also a case of the public health necessity to really control these substances, and especially like metals that can be neurotoxic. Yeah, exactly. It's extraordinarily difficult to do in some ways uh, because it can be really hard to figure out exactly what environmental toxins are causing problems. It's a, a difficult epidemiological study to conduct. Um, but you're exactly right. And, and certainly in some ways we've been successful in figuring out uh, these conundrums because we have laws now about uh, you know lead and paint and, uh, and things like that. So you also write about molecules such as vitamins. So can you describe how and why are they important for our brain? So vitamins are a set of molecules that are critical for us to have in our body, and we have to get them from our diets. And so the, the story, or one of the stories I, I tell about vitamins is uh, about a condition called pellagra. And this uh, became a problem in the early 1900s in the southeastern U.S. There was this huge epidemic of pellagra where hundreds of thousands of people were coming down with the condition. Uh, many of them were dying from it. And it causes a, a remarkable dementia. It causes a gruesome rash. Uh, and it causes an upset stomach. And nobody could figure out what's causing the, the condition. And there was this idea floating around that it was a, an infection. And the disease tended to affect poor people. And so for a lot of people, that felt uh, sort of like an easy explanation because we could say, well, you know, it's poor people's fault. They don't have good sanitation. and They brought the disease on themselves. And... Then the Surgeon General ends up calling on this guy, Joseph Goldberger. And Goldberger was a, uh, a, a man who was born at the, the foot of the Carpathian Mountains, came to the U.S. at age nine, speaking almost no English. Uh, he works his way up to become a, a physician uh, or doctor. He uh, ends up trying to hang a shingle, but just can't make enough money. So he joins the public health service. And he goes all around the country, all around the world. He contracts uh, typhus and typhoid and yellow fever. He's really in the, in the trenches. And the Surgeon General calls on Goldberger and says, you know, why don't you figure out this problem of pellagra? And Goldberger starts looking at the literature, and he figures out that this isn't at all caused by a, uh, an infection. Actually, it's caused by a vitamin or a nutritional deficiency. Uh, and uh, he gets a lot of pushback because then the story, instead of it being, well, poor people have brought it on themselves because of their sanitation practice, it's 
actually that we're starving our own people. It's a totally different, you know, it's different optics. So he gets a lot of resistance to his idea. And eventually he says, you know, I'm going to prove to you that this is not a infectious disease. So he uh, goes to a clinic that has patients with pellagra and he ends up doing a sort of a stomach churning experiments. He scrapes off scales from their rash. He takes samples of their stool. He takes samples of their urine. He takes blood samples and he exposes himself and a few other volunteers to all of it. So he uh, forms it into capsules and swallows it. He injects some of the blood into his shoulder. He rubs some of their mucus on his own nose. It's just these you know graphic experiments. Ooh. Even his wife volunteered for them. Um, and in the end of it, he says, you know, considering the amount of filth that we took in, we did pretty well. Uh, and none of us got pellagra. And so it's not an infectious disease. And ultimately, he figures out that it's a, you know, it is a nutritional problem, and it's a deficiency in a vitamin. And he dies before they can figure out exactly which vitamin it is. So this also led to inclusion of some of, the, some of these vitamins and nutrients in uh, food as well, hasn't it? It has. So right now, yeah, but all, many vitamins are actually added to things like flour and cereal. So vitamin deficiencies now are much more uncommon than they used to be. And it turns out actually that even though lots of people will take vitamin supplements, in most cases, we don't really need them because usually we're getting enough of those vitamins in our food. And what about evaders? So, so the evaders were the were the the vitamins. So these are uh, the molecules where we we need them and they're not there. So something like vitamins where we uh, we need to have them. Oh yes, that's right. <laughs> so, um, what is the part of patients in all of these stories? So, how prominent is their role in sort of figuring out what's wrong? And uh, do we have better relationships with patients nowadays? So it's a great question. Uh, I could tell you in our own clinic, uh, when I see patients in many cases, uh, aside from trying to figure out what is the molecule that I think is, is related or causing their disease, I also try to figure out, are there research trials that they might qualify for? Because you know, we don't have a cure for Alzheimer's disease or another condition called Lewy body disease or another condition called frontotemporal dementia. And we're only going to figure out a cure if we have patients who participate in, in research projects. That's the only way we're going to find it. Um, and so that's a, a big part of our of our clinic is uh, is offering that opportunity to, to patients. Looking at all of these stories uh, from well near and uh, far past, uh, we can see the, the different way of how scientists worked in those days. So how has the culture changed in, you know, in a way that we will still want to figure out things, but we need to uh, take into account much different social settings? So I think uh, certainly in terms of ethics, the, the landscape now is totally different than it was before. Uh, the guy who figured out uh, the cause of pellagra, he actually, one of the other experiments he did, uh, he was trying to prove that if you change someone's diet, you could cause pellagra. And he did that by going to a prison uh, in Missouri and, uh, and saying, you know, if anyone wants to volunteer for this experiment, you can get out of jail, essentially. So you can get out of prison if you participate. And uh, we're going to feed you all these things. And he basically named all these delicious foods that were essentially only carbohydrates, didn't have many, uh, you know, vitamin, high vitamin content. He got like 80 volunteers, uh, ended up taking 12 of them. And he fed them essentially a carbohydrate only diet for about six months or so uh, and prove that many of them came down with a disease that they thought was pellagra and uh, they get pardoned but essentially you know something like that would obviously never be approved now and there's an article about the the end of that study where these people go into the governor's office to get their pardon and the jackson daily news runs this article that says uh, they ate their way to freedom um, so that's something that you, know, you could never have something like that now uh, for, for, for clear reasons. And uh, so the ethical landscape is obviously you know, totally different. We're so much more careful about valuing autonomy and making sure that patients are making, uh, making decisions with, uh, with informed consent. So that's been a, a huge change over the course of the history that I've written about in the book. 
And the other big change, uh, I think, is the, the gender of the researchers. So much of the research that was done in the early 1900s, it's essentially all men, because uh, that was the, the main population in, in scientific spheres. Whereas more recently, there is such a huge uh, burst of, of women in science, and uh, the, the, the balance is very much switching. So what are some of the ways that researchers try to sort of go around these uh, issues, like ethical issues? And uh, what kind of techniques are they starting to employ? Maybe using VR, for example, in some cases? So it's a great it's a it's a great question. I think right now the way that we try to navigate ethical issues is to have an institutional review board. So we have outside people telling us, you know, what's okay and, and what's not okay. Uh, and there's a huge emphasis on making sure that patients understand what they're what they're signing up for. Yeah, but I don't know of any particular things like VR specifically for uh, for use of uh, for sort of increasing ethical practice. It's a great question. I've never thought about it before. And thinking about the challenges in the field, especially when it comes to molecules like psychedelics. So, how far are we um, from sort of very good and uh, standardized ways to? research them to really see what kind of benefits they can bring. So research on psychedelics is becoming more popular. And uh, and I do think we're making headway in trying to find some outlets where they do seem to be helpful in particular conditions. And uh, the way that we're figuring that out is by studying them in, in settings that are relatively controlled. Um, and that's, I think, particularly important in terms of being able to interpret the results. Yeah, but but psychedelics are sort of a it's a, a contentious issue for for obvious reasons, and uh, it, it's it's controversial. And I think a lot more work needs to be done in terms of establishing, you know, how how useful are they and and in what settings. So, what do you want to find out in the near future? So I. The holy grail is to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. That's the Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. It causes about 60 to 70 percent of cases, and it robs people of their memories and, and so much more than just memory. And it really essentially eventually robs people of their identities. And the, the holy grail is to find a, a cure or a treatment for it. And we, we haven't been successful yet, although we've made incredible advances. Um, but that's probably the, the single biggest discovery that we have not yet made that will change the quality of life for people with dementia. And many of our listeners uh, probably heard about the recent drug aducanumab that was uh... Uh, approved by the um, Food and Drug Administration. So are we getting any closer with uh, this? So, yeah, so it's obviously a very controversial uh, topic. So it turns out, you know, what did Alzheimer's discover originally in the early 1900s? He looked at the, the brain of someone who had memory loss, and he found two structures that we now talk about. One is called plaques that looks sort of like a spray painted dot. And the other is called tangles, and that looks sort of like a little piece of spaghetti inside of neurons. And we now know that the plaques are made of a protein called amyloid, and the tangles are made of a protein called tau. And it turns out that amyloid builds up about 10 to 15 years before symptoms of Alzheimer's disease start. And it builds up all over the brain. It just sort of drapes the brain. And then uh, tau tends to build up along with the actual symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And so because of that, and for some other reasons as well, for a long time, people have thought that if we could just get rid of amyloid, we could sort of stop the, the process, we could prevent the train from leaving the station. And so people invented all of these medications that cleaned up amyloid. And aducanumab is one of the, the strongest of this type of medications. And uh, we know from, from good studies that if you give someone who has amyloid in the brain, if you give them aducanumab, it's really good at cleaning up the amyloid. But it turns out that we don't know that that actually changes their symptoms. And so yeah, with the, the company that made aducanumab, they did these two huge trials, each with, with more than 1,000 people. And they ended up stopping the trials early because they thought the drug didn't work. 
And then when they went back and evaluated the, the data, they noticed that in people who got the highest dose of the medication, if they filter it out some uh, sort of a small uh, sort of subpopulation of people, there seemed to be maybe a signal that the drug was helping. And so based on that and based on the sort of idea that cleaning up amyloid should help, the FDA went on to to approve the medication. Um, But it was very controversial because the data wasn't of the quality that we usually think of when we approve medications. And and this is a a high stakes, uh, a high stakes game because there are millions of people with the disease and it's really expensive to treat them. So if we're going to if we're going to use these medications, we want to know that they work. And uh, so it turned out that lots of people who had advised the FDA, who had felt like the data was not rigorous and and, uh, was not convincing enough, uh, several people stepped down. And uh, and ultimately, when Medicare went to uh, decide whether or not they were going to pay for the medication, they essentially decided they're only going to pay for it for people who are involved in a research study. And so at this point, the way that we talk to patients about the medication is, is this, as is we say, you know, it's, it's sort of still in a research phase uh, in the sense that we, we don't yet know if it works. And so if you're someone who would have wanted to participate in a research study, then uh, it's not unreasonable to, you know, to join, join the study where it's going to be covered. Um, but if you're someone who says, you know, I only want to take a medication if it's been proven to help and if we're sure that it's going to help then it's probably not yet the time to, to be taking a medication like that. And what about the preventative approaches? So we've, you've spoken about uh, the drugs and uh, the molecules. So are we starting to think more about the lifestyle choices that we can make um, in order to have the healthy brain? Yeah, so it turns out we actually know a lot about lifestyle changes that can affect the brain. So the the four things that we tell our patients are are this. Uh, So some of the best data is for exercise, something like 30 to 40 minutes a day, uh, four days a week of something aerobic, so something that gets your heart rate up brisk walking, a recumbent bike, something like that. And it turns out that has an impressive effect on on normal aging and also we think slows down uh, the evolution of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there's been a, a uh, there was an amazing study of people who had a genetic mutation that causes a, a different type of dementia, and it turned out that the people who were sort of the the top exercises progressed about fifty percent slower than the people who didn't really exercise. So it just has this immense effect. Yeah, other than that, uh, there's some data that, that something like the Mediterranean diet also is good for cognition and it slows down uh, cognitive loss. Um, it's difficult to study diet. You can imagine, yeah, you know, you probably couldn't tell me what you ate yesterday. I can't tell you exactly what I ate yesterday. And uh, if I was in a study where they told me to eat certain things, I probably wouldn't follow the rules. So it's really hard to study diet versus exercise. You know, you can have someone show up for a class and you've proven that they've exercised. Yeah. And the other two things are, are social and intellectual engagement. And there's great data dating back decades that the more sort of uh, social points of contact that you have, the slower people decline. And intellectually, there isn't you know, perfect data for any particular activity. What we really tell folks is that they should choose something that they enjoy. So if you like Sudoku, that's great. If you like reading a magazine, that's just as good. Uh, but, you know, if you like listening to music, that's great. Uh, the key is just something that's engaging so that you're not watching TV all day. So thinking about the bigger picture, so taking into account uh, both these uh, things, so trying to prevent the aging-related disorders of the brain with their lifestyle changes, but also trying to find this holy grail of the drug that can cure some of these conditions. What would be the impact on our society if we do or we don't uh, find these uh, sort of solutions? So I think if, if we don't find solutions, it's it's quite staggering. So there is uh, there is data that I, I want to say, I don't want to misquote it. I want to say it's by 2050 that the number of people with dementia will triple. Um, it's a huge burden of disease. Um, and to care for people with dementia, at least in the United States, is uh, sort of woefully underfunded. It's extraordinarily expensive. And what often happens is that family members end up quitting their jobs to take care of their uh, their aging uh, relatives, and uh, that also, you know, then affects the next generation. 
And so it's just a, a horribly broken system in its current state. Um, and if we can find a cure for it, that not only will relieve the the patients who are actually, you know, would have suffered the symptoms, but also relieves their family members. It allows them to continue being productive members of the workforce. It allows them to keep uh, sort of preserving the, the memory of those people so that their grandchildren will be able to capture those experiences and pass them on to the next generation. This sounds such a huge problem, doesn't it? And such a tough nut to crack. But looking at the stories that you feature in your book, that's, uh, you kind of leave, it leaves you hopeful that even some of the very, div, uh, very complex, complex diseases can be, can be sort of, you know, cracked <laughs> in the end. So do you have and a lot of hope for the future? I do. And Galena, I'm glad to hear you say that. So, you know, I think I feel hopeful for the future. When I initially wrote the book, some of the feedback I got was that it was not hopeful. And I realized I had sort of conveyed the wrong message. So I'm glad that the right one seems to have sort of come through in the final version. Because um, it, it's really meant to be a hopeful book. Most of the conditions that I write about actually have cures now. A hundred years ago, all of these conditions were deadly. And now most of them, we actually have treatments. It's pretty incredible, the, the, the progress that we've made. And even though there are these big projects that we have not solved, and we've been incredibly successful. And we know more about some of these conditions than, than we ever did. Even something like Alzheimer's disease, until recently, the only way that you could figure out if someone had amyloid and tau proteins in their brain was at, at autopsy after they died. So it was this terrible thing where you would say, you know, I think this is what your disease is, but I can't prove it to you until you die. And now we actually have tools to take pictures of people's brains and prove that amyloid or tau proteins are building up in their brain. And this is while they're still alive. And that's incredible, not only for diagnosis, but also for choosing who we want to enroll in research trials for Alzheimer's disease. Until we had these tools, it was very difficult to figure out who had Alzheimer's disease and who didn't. So finding a drug that treated it was particularly complicated because we didn't know who to put in these research trials. And now we can be far more specific. So we've made these huge strides. And what discoveries along your journey to writing your book, A Molecule Away from Madness, surprised you the most? I think I didn't know any of the stories of these scientists. I had no concept of the people who were behind these diseases. Yeah, and uh, the stories are just remarkable. There's, you know, the guy who figured out that the nervous system is made of multiple cells and not just one cell. He was this Spanish researcher who uh, was working in his laboratory, made this big discovery, and didn't know how to communicate it to the world. And so he ended up paying uh, to print up copies of his research. Uh, he spent so much money that they couldn't hire a nanny. Uh, so his wife is stuck doing all the child care because he spent all his money printing up his research. He sends it all around Europe, expecting people to come back and say, you know, what an amazing discovery. But he doesn't hear anything. And he realizes, oh my gosh, you know, I wrote it in Spanish. I bet they don't understand Spanish. So he decides he has to actually go see these folks in person. So he packs his microscope, he packs his slides, brings them to a conference in Germany, and ends up setting up a booth. And he sets up these slides underneath the microscopes. And the people that start lining up at the beginning are sort of doubtful, but eventually, the sort of uh, the sort of head honchos of the uh, sort of prominent people at the conference end up seeing the slides and believing him. And that's how we, you know, as a, the a scientific world figured out that the nervous system is made of multiple cells. And so these stories are just amazing of these scientists who had to work so hard to convince the world of what they thought was correct. So earlier on, you mentioned that the landscape of this sci uh, sort of scientific landscape is changing in terms of diversity and representation. So how important uh, to you is it to have more uh, sort of female uh, representatives in scientists in sciences? <laughs> So I think there's been a huge push lately, yeah, but to try to increase diversity in the sciences, and um, and that's a push that's been made at the university level, uh, in journals, in scholarships. Yeah, and this is a I think a, a different world than we were in e even five years ago, um, and I think we're sort of slowly starting to to see the effects of that. And uh, we're learning that it's really helpful for people to have mentors who come from similar backgrounds and, uh, and that that's key. 
And I think that in particular, the the role of mentorship in increasing diversity and increasing access to the sciences is, is critical. And I think we're getting better at that. And what about representation of scientists in media? So if you watch a movie uh, where it has uh, scientists in it, do you normally screen, uh, scream at the screen saying like, that is wrong? <laughs> So there are some times when, uh, you know, you say, oh, my gosh, you know, how do they ever you know, get someone to sign off on this? Um, in particular, there are depictions of dementia that uh, some of which can just be uh, sort of um, you cringe when you watch them. Um, but others are, are better done. And, uh, you know, I think it's hard in the media to, to get things right. Um, but uh, I think a lot of productions end up having, you know, a scientist on board or someone to sign off on things. The the classic picture of a neurologist in the media is someone who's, you know, aloof and uh, sort of totally out of touch with social graces. Yeah, and uh, and I always get sad seeing that because I think actually, uh, at least the the neurology department where I am, the people are are wonderful and warm and and kind. So uh, they sometimes get a bad rap in the media. And as you're a neurologist, I just have to ask, so do you follow the Mediterranean diet? <laughs> well, I, I have a, uh, a four-year-old and a nine-month-old, so I mostly follow the cereal diet. <laughs> So no, I probably don't take my own advice. And uh, there's, uh, you know, I talk to patients often that, you know, we tell them the ideal of what they should do. And then at some point that gets translated into reality and not a single patient does everything I tell them to do. <laughs> and that's normal. Oh, oh, that's great to hear. So the rest of us can have that uh, second piece of cake with a very right. polite conscience. <laughs> well, right, we all, for yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, we all forget medications from time to time. And, uh, you know, one thing that we talk about with patients in clinic is, you know, are, are you missing medications? Do you have extra pills left in the bottle at the end of the month? And you have to have some uh, some grace period or some uh, some leeway to give them, you know, a chance to miss some medications because that's, you know, some hu that's, it's human. Oh, that's great to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a fascinating discussion. So can you tell us what are you currently working on and what will be your next project or a book? So I, I, I'm hoping to write another book. I have a few ideas that I'm, uh, you know, uh, thinking of, yeah, but I'm not sure which direction uh, I'll go next. And then I have a, a small thought of trying to write a children's book, although I know there are so many people who write adult books and then try to write a children's book and it, uh, it, it fails miserably. But uh, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to write next, but, uh, but I'm looking forward to, to doing it. Our children are the harshest critics. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But at least I have in-house ones. So. <laughs> and what would be the best way for our, your, our listeners to look up your work and also to learn more about your book? So thanks so much for asking. So uh, the easiest is to look at my website. So it's saramanningpeskin.com. So it's uh, S A R A. Uh, M-A-N-N-I-N-G-P-E-S-K-I-N. -N -N -E uh, so it's saramanningpeskin.com. Or if you look the book up, uh, it's A Molecule Away from Madness, Tales of the Hijacked Brain. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much, Galita, for having me. This is such a treat. <laughs>